All right, so um, my name is Nick Duty. I'm from the EBI in Cambridge. I'm going to talk about identifiers.org. Um, I'll split the talk into basically two halves. There's a basic introduction for those of you who are not familiar with our system. Um, and then there's an update on what we've been doing in the past year or so. Sorry, is that okay? Okay. Okay. Right, so uh, the basic, basic objective uh, for identifiers.org is to provide URIs, uh, resolvable URIs, to identify life science data. Uh, on top of that, we built some various functionality, some of which I'll describe uh, as I go through the talk. Uh, it's a community-driven effort in the sense that we listen to what our users want, and hopefully some of you agree that we kind of take steps to address your concerns. Uh, it's free to use, of course, and it's centered on a curated registry. Actually, the, curate, uh, the registry has just moved to uh, data centers in London to make sure it's a bit more stable. Um, and on top, of the, on top of the registry, we have a resolving layer. So we have a, a curated collection of a, over 500 uh, data sets at the moment. Some of those are quite familiar to most of you, Gene Ontology, Uniprop, uh, Kebby, Kemble, so on. Um, there's a link there at the bottom where you can see the CR registry. Uh, if you go there, you see that we have um, on the left side the data collection name, on the right side a description, and we collect together the namespace. You can query that registry uh, with you know, keywords, or if you know this, the first letter of your data collection, whatever, you can go by the alph alphabetical uh, category there. Um, but besides that basic information of namespace and collection name and description, we store a lot of other information as well. So, um, so, so on the bottom there you can see we collect together all the URIs that we know of that are associated with that data collection, um, all the places where you can resolve to to get information, um, and um, an identifier pattern which describes uh, the, the format of the identifier that's used by the data, prov uh, data provider. Um, one thing I want to point out, and people get confused all the time, is we don't actually store all the data itself. So we don't have all of Uniprot's data. We store information about Uniprot and how to access their information. Um, so if you go to the registry again, you can see here's all that information. There's some tags that we associate with each data collection so you can try and find it. Um, importantly, we have a separate identifier for each of the resolving locations, which we call resources. Uh, so the basic concept is that we consider these data collections as location-independent pools of data. So here the example is taxonomy, and we think of the records there as location-independent. Since we store information about the res uh, resources, which are the resolving locations, we can associate those together so that you can have a location-independent uh, location identifier and know the information of where to get, uh, know the resolving locations basically for each of the resources that we st uh, store information for. So this is what the um, basic uh, URI would look for. This is the identifiers.org, that's the resolver. Uh, we take the namespace, which is stored in our registry, and the identifier, which is provided by the data provider themselves. So it's not one we make up. So in this case, this is the Homo sapiens record in taxonomy. So that, that's the URI for, for, for that entity in, the, in their data collection, uh, in their data set. But we also have another URI to identify our record in the registry, so our record of the, this concept. Um, oops. Um, so what happens is, if you take this URI and put it into a browser, you actually go straight to the NCBI page. Um, and that's because there's an algorithm which takes into account whether that resource is the primary provider for that data. It records, we record the uptime of these resources over time and also check each morning whether it's up. So based on that algorithm, it will take you to the most appropriate site. So if this was down, it would take you to one of the other resources. Um, and if you want to find out information um, about all those other resources, you can put info in the front. And actually, when you go to this page, there's a link for this that's available at the top that you can click. Um, one of the other things that we thought that our users would want is information about the different kinds of formats that the, uh, the resource uh, resources provide. So for example, NCBI may only provide HTML records, um, and by 2 rdf might give you links to HTML, RDF, and JSON. So we want to record that um, so that people can, for example, by contact negotiation, go to the most appropriate format that they want. 
Um, so this, this is in development at the moment. Um, last year we changed the data model that we have so we could capture that information. So that wasn't available previously. Um, but now it is and we've put a curation interface so that we can, this is, this is the Uniprop mock-up version that's in development at the moment. Um, we can record the URI to access the RDF and you can see there's a button to, to register different formats there. Um, so what would happen is once it's deployed uh, in, the, in the registry, you could, you'd get an additional format appear here for that resource provider and that would also be reflected in the info domain um, with an extra clickable button there. Um, what we also provide is information on converting between identification schemes. So since we record all this URI information and access uh, URLs, it's possible to use one of our REST services, and there's examples on the, on the uh, registry page if you go there, um, to, to, to go between. So you can, you can send a query to find out what are all the URIs that are associated with this. So you'd be able to do a conversion. We also have a Sparkle compatible endpoint. Um, so you can do the same conversion there, so that allows you to basically bridge the gap between the URIs that different um, data sets use, so um, the EBI RDF platform or BI2 RDF. Um, so there's, there's a URL there for uh, the Sparkle endpoint. Um, this, is, this is actually for identifies to org as a whole rather than just the Sparkle, so that, that, that link's wrong. Uh, so this is show that we have a, we have quite a lot of widespread geographical usage. Um, I think last month we had something in excess of 325,000 requests. Uh, I don't have any stats just for the Sparkle uh, Sparkle service that we have, but um, last year it was deployed halfway through last year, something like that. Um, we had uh, 12,000 unique users and something like 200. 200,000 plus uh, Sparkle requests. Um, so, so last year there was a slide presented on what other changes we're doing to make the make the registry more open. So obviously there's there's a lot of information to curate with those RDF. Uh, so with those um, other formats that we're trying to uh, provide information for, there's obviously more curation that needs to be done because all of those URIs need to be added manually. So we want to make it easier for the community to contribute to the registry and to maintain it. So what we wanted to do was uh, enable some sort of login um, without having to create a specific account for the registry, so reusing a Google ID or something like that. Um, we wanted to, wanted to have people be able to take ownership of resources, so be able to update the URLs themselves without going through us, and create profiles because sometimes people don't want to automatically go to a particular resource, so you may not want to go always to the primary provider, you may have a preferred, uh, preferred resource that you want to go to. So this is how profiles would work. It's basically an extra parameter as provided, and this would be something that you create yourself. So I've crossed that bit out because it hasn't quite happened yet, but I'll talk about now uh, the progress we've made towards it. So, so we had um, in place this authentication system, so you could use it like an open ID or something. Um, unfortunately, um, the Google authentication service changed and it kind of broke the work that we've done so far. So that's being looked at at the moment. But this is what it would look like. Right now it's only open to curators, uh, that's people in our group. Um, this is kind of ready, but again it's, it's blocked by this uh, uh, registration or login, login page. So if you wanted to take ownership, for example, of this resource and say that you know, you're, the, you're, the, you're responsible for the administration of this so that you could update any information there, so the access URLs, for example, uh, you'd click this button, that would fire off an email to our team, and then we'd go through, verify that you're the right person, and give you access to that. Um, and also profiles, so as I mentioned, this allow you to customize like behavior of uh, the URIs. Um, so th this is an example, one that I've, I've given for, um, for the buy models uh, profile. So you can see here that uh, you, could, you list basically your data collection and then you get a drop down of all the resources that are associated with each of those and you can pick which one you want. So that's again not quite ready but um, not too far off. Uh, there's a few links there, so identifies to org and the, the registry. Um, if you want to um, find out any more information, there's a couple of uh, mailing lists. 
and that's where you can send uh, individual requests or bug reports. Um, I just want to thank uh, our trustees, so some of them are here, Michelle, um, Michelle's here, Toshiaki is obviously here, Mark, um, team, especially Kami, and uh, we've had a, a variety of funding sources over the years. Uh, currently we're working with Biomed Bridges and uh, crossing over into Elixir. Um, and that's the summary slide I'll leave you with, which kind of puts all the information in one place and I'll take some questions.